All right, thanks for checking in. Welcome back to another one of our Google Hangouts, the ongoing series we're conducting here, the intersection of art and innovation. Uh, I've been joined in the past few months by a, a variety of writers and musicians, and I've had the opportunity to speak to a couple of people that work more directly with um, promotion and, and publicity, and uh, more of them, I think, is better because these people really have all their hands uh, in, in the pie, so to speak, in terms of, of all aspects of how technology is impacting various industries. So today I'm exceptionally happy to be joined by Matt Merowitz. Uh, he is the founder of Fully Altered Media. And I've known Matt for several years and I, I've applauded him uh, directly and from the sidelines as a, as a big advocate for artists, uh, especially the jazz community. Uh, he's, he's tied in very deep, very, very passionate as I'm sure you're about to see. And we'd love to talk to him today about how he's seen things change from a technological perspective and the ways in which that's impacted what he does. So Matt, why don't you jump in and, and give us a sense of, of how you got to where you are and how you founded Fully Altered and, and you know what's brought you to the moment. Well, thanks for having me, Sean, and CEA. Um, I, uh, I definitely have been immensely impacted by social media and just, you know, the advent of all these technologies. Um, I was brought on into the industry through um, a company called DL Media, which is also a jazz publicity firm um, that technically, well, that tends to specify, specialize a little bit more in um, more straight ahead jazz. I found my niche in kind of more slightly avant garde still a lot of it many would consider very accessible to rock music fans um, also to fans of world music and stuff like that so anyway I started out at DL Media in 2006 and that was in Philadelphia and I was brought on specifically to be a new media publicist which at the time like who knew what that meant we did that's what that's what my boss Don Lukoff called it but um, you know, so I was reaching out to bloggers, um, mainly bloggers and and people at websites. You know, I, I I tried to make inroads with websites like Pitchfork and Pop Matters, and uh, you know, uh, there was there was um, my old Kentucky blog, and there was you know all the indie rock stuff, and so I was trying to make inroads for jazz artists with those types of places, and I over time found that that was somewhat of a maybe futile task although certain people have had successes in other areas that are not jazz um, but you know I, I tend to now with all the experience that I have um, since leaving DL Media in 2009 mm -hmm. fully uh, uh, I, I um, I was working concurrently on my own stuff um, for Pi Recordings and for uh, Vijay Iyer and Rudresh Mahantapa and a bunch of other people. Um, one of my first clients was a, actually, not co coincidentally, a drummer from Chicago um, named Mike Reed who yep. happens to have two uh, parallel careers. One, uh, not really... I'm not totally clear, but he's very involved in the Pitchfork Festival and his other career is as a jazz drummer. Right. So, um, but over time, the point is I've, I've felt that, I've come to feel that, you know, it's not enough to just hire a publicist or have a label, just do your, you know, handle your business. You know, artists and creative people have to have to be personally engaged in social media and you know overall the the marketing process what a lot of people in the business call direct to fan marketing which is um, really a, a direct connection with one's fans or potential fans and the most powerful medium for doing so um, in my opinion is email um, a direct connection with your fans through email so yeah, you know that's that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, I'm I'm uh, 
Yeah, you know, it's it's. I'm traditionally known as a publicist, but I work with people developing their mailing lists, mm -hmm. uh, developing their social media presence, developing their quote unquote voice in social media or via a mailing list. A lot of people feel like they have to have a different tone when they're talking to people via a mailing list versus talking to them in person or in front of an audience or you know whatever. They don't want to hit you too hard over the head with a sales pitch but they want to be they want to still sell you something but they also want to be personable. So I come up with you know strategies for how to navigate those different uh, uh, sensibilities. Sure, sure. And, and so it sounds like w when you were talking about when you when you went to uh, DL, you, you were basically taking a job that didn't really even exist before you had it. Where did you find that you were working with some folks who were more you know had hands and 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 feet in the more kind of traditional model? And did you encounter resistance, or did, was this more a result of people realizing we need to have a media presence, we need to get caught up with how to reach this wide audience via all this online innovation and technology? I mean, I think the biggest barriers initially, you know, when you're a new name, a young person in the industry, you, you have to really be aggressive and, and make your mark and... Um, it's just like being an artist. You have to fight with complete obscurity for a couple of years, you know, some longer than others, uh, to just kind of get on the map, get on people's radars that you're presenting them with something that's quality content. Um, I hate to use it in, in, say it in those terms, but that is valuable and valid to their lives. Sure. You know, and... You know, so a lot of the building process with the bloggers initially was really trying to figure out and who's, you know, not. And 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 that, you know, was a building process. And, and over time, you know, certain places I stopped really trying super hard. Mm -hmm. And with the advent of, you know, the, the timeline features and Facebook and the whole tagging system and Twitter and Instagram and all this stuff, like, I've just found that a more, like, holistic, integrated thing where you're tapping into all the available outlets for you that are free or close to free. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Facebook has basically become pretty much pay-to-play if you're a business or if you're any kind of entity that doesn't have you know, 5,000 friends. Right. Um, uh, you know, and even if you do have tons and tons of likes on Facebook, you do have to pay for those people to actually see your posts. So it's 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 become a different playing field. However, mm -hmm. to address your question, that yes, I did come into a position that didn't exist prior to me holding the position, and I, you know, I had to just roll with the punches and 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 eventually, you know, people started picking up on ability and and you know my passion for mm -hmm. you know the the type of music that I work on. So, and what you're what you're talking about is is the topic that really kind of comes up often in these discussions, and it is inevitable even as it becomes more of a hackneyed kind of phrase that's that's laden with all sorts of meanings. But the the idea of brand building, um, whether you're a company or an artist is really what you're you're getting at in terms of utilizing all aspects of what's available be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, mail lists and so forth. Um, I, I did note uh, with some amusement that you in your bio describe yourself as having an unhealthy social media habit and I guess my response to that would be you're really describing all of us to a certain extent no matter what our endeavors are because that's really the that's kinda of the playground that we're all in now and the, the business and personal worlds are increasingly overlapping. Right. I mean, yeah, it it's, takes a while to build credibility, totally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, that's just, yeah, that's completely what it is. And it, it's the same for artists. I mean, you know, some artists, I mean, definitely 
if you're an artist coming out of school today, you need to know a certain amount about you know what it's going to take for you to to really make it in this industry. Um, and it's not it's not clear cut, and there's no real one codified way to do it, but you know, you need to you need to have a list, a mailing list. You need to build a mailing list. You need to mention your mailing list at shows and and really uh, actively try to engage people in your in your presence or your branding, even when they're not listening to your music or listening to you play live. It's just right. you have to. You have to keep yourself in the conversation by being present in the conversation. Sure, I mean, and, and that's so another, yeah, that's kind of what I'm what I preach to my clients. You know, I, I think that's that's kind of the the key uh, again. And I don't think you have one. One doesn't need to be selling or or creating anything to understand that with all this accessibility and all these avenues of of advertising oneself or one's brand. The other, the other side of that, of course, is inevitably you can, you stand to be drowned out uh, in the, the the mass of other tweets and Facebook posts. I'd be curious for you to talk a little, a little bit more about. Give me an example of how you know you work with certain artists and you know kind of what you do, what what you task them to do, and is it just really a matter of your all all parties involved need to be kind of plugging the you know hitting that all the time and it's just a combined effort of, of just constant interaction I mean I think you know one of my most successful clients the pianist and recent MacArthur Foundation uh, fellow Vijay Iyer mm -hmm. um, he's an example of someone who has a good balance of art and commerce I guess you could say um, you know, he makes his opinions very well known via his Twitter feed. He's very active politically and engaged politically um, and vocal about how he feels about society and, you know, race issues and, you know, uh, stuff regarding, you know, just stuff that affects every... Everybody, healthcare, you know, gay rights, you know, just human rights in general. I mean, so it, it get, it's getting a little bit, you know, corny, but but the point is that he makes his voice heard on these issues, you know. Right, right. So, um, and you can follow him at at v i j a y i y e r. Um, I don't know if I can type that here, but yeah, we can. Uh, we, we can. We can blast that out when we when we promote this later. And, yeah. I, and I certainly can put a. So anyway, um, he's a brilliant. I mean, Vijay is a good example. I represent some people. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no! I, I, so how about an? So it sounds like he's pretty plugged in and, and pretty savvy. Have you had to bring some artists kicking and screaming? I, I you know, I know. By by nature, there's a lot of artists that of tend course. to be more introverted and intense, and it doesn't come as second nature to promote and self promote and and have an active social media presence. Is that where you they lean a little more heavily on you to do some of that? Sure, I mean there's a lot of hand holding that takes place, uh, you know, both in terms of uh, getting them to acclimate. And also teaching them the 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 um what's it called the uh, the jargon the the uh, mm -hmm. syntax sure you know that's proper to use. I mean, a lot of people just go hog wild with hashtagging, and it's become like a a crazy you know almost like you know internet meme to hashtag ridiculous things sure. long you know, run on sentences even. I mean, I was I was watching some event on TV recently. I think it was the Oscars and
every brand that was advertising on the Oscars. Yeah, I mean, that's just, yeah, that's, and I think people are both, it does get to a certain point of saturation, I'd imagine, where people are almost kind of tuning that out now, which brings us to another point, which is that this, they're, they're, things are changing so quickly and, and evolving that to have a presence and, and to remain relevant, you kind of have to keep abreast of, of what's working and what's trending and ways in which, you know, if, if you fall asleep at the wheel for even a couple of days, it seems, with technology now, you're already kind of passe and, and one wants to avoid uh, being irrelevant at all costs. And, and there's no book that exists that I'm aware of, certainly right now, that says if you do these five things, you'll make it. Um, right. I think there's all kinds of best practices and sites are putting up lists and stories all the time. This series discusses these issues, but I think the reality, and, and you certainly can attest to this, there is not one prescribed model that uh, will work, uh, but it really is a matter of being engaged and aware, and it, it's, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job to understand how to take advantage of these platforms in a way that's effective, because otherwise you're going to drown out with all the rest of the noise. Totally. I mean, like, when I hear that people's kids today are much less on Facebook and much more on Snapchat, a platform which I've not myself ventured onto just because I'm not, like, there yet mentally or, like, I have so much other stuff going on that I can't right. possibly absorb another social media platform. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't, like, I feel like an old person, uh, you know, like, just, I feel like I'm becoming out of touch with, you know, what is current in social networking because there's always something new every day. And I, I was on this panel during the APAP conference, the Association of Performing Arts Presenters in New York, and people were talking about Snapchat, and I was like, <laughs> like, I know I know that this exists, but I don't know what it is and, like, really how to use it. I mean, I'd certainly, you know, it, it's hard to build numbers. I mean, you have to have an authentic voice. You have to have a variety of interests, and you have to tweet or Facebook or you know, post in general about that variety of interests. It helps to, you know, have... You know, you can't always be selling, right? You can't always be pushing your product unless, I mean, certain corporate brands, you know, can't, that, that it's, it's, it's like marketing 101 that you can't steer conversation away from your own brand. You have to always keep it within the brand. But, like, right. I feel like organizations who, like, who use social media to their best advantage, they talk about a number of things. Like the people who I enjoy following on Twitter and Facebook really, like, do have a diverse set of interests. You know, there's a, a percussionist named James Shipp um, with two Ps, S-H-I-P-P, -P, mm -hmm. who's a hilarious person in general, and I don't understand how he's not, you know how he hasn't broken through to the comedy scene because he's so intensely funny um, just in his critiques of society, in his Facebook posts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just... So the people who I find interesting and, like, wanting to hang out with or engage with their music are people who, you know, have a unique voice, you know? Right. Um there's other examples. I mean, somebody who I had to drag kicking and screaming a little bit is a pianist named Dan Tepfer, uh, who then just found Twitter to be his, like, a natural medium for him, and it, he just flourished with it. And, you know, uh, his colleague, um, the saxophonist Ben Wendell, uh, I don't know how early he adopted, if he was an early adopter or later adopter, but he's amassed a good following for someone who's, you know, kind of yet to really burst through on the, on a general national radar. It's still within the jazz community, mm -hmm. um, but he's in a very successful band 
within the jazz world called Knee Body, um, who are a really exciting band to listen to. I mean, one of my clients, Dave Douglas, has a lot of variety, varied interests. He's sure. a runner. He he trains for marathons. He talks about, you know, getting out in nature and just, I mean, he, he's a kind of a, a trumpet brass nerd. Yeah. You know, he has a lot of interests outside of um, the traditional jazz sphere. He runs his own label called Greenleaf Music, which has um, been around now for nine years, going to be ten years in 2015. And um, he's constantly releasing records, putting out newsletters to his email list. Um, all, all, you know, at the same time, we're often f trying to find a balance between, you know, what is too much saturation in terms of emails and social media presence yeah. and all that, and what's, like, not enough or just the right amount. Um, his manager turned me on to uh, a social media scheduling service called Buffer, which is very useful when it works. Uh, I've had some issues with them just in terms of the, the times and the time zones that the defaults are set to um, for when tweets and Facebook posts go out. But that's a very useful platform. I mean, I know that, that uh, what's it called? Um, what's the general one tweet deck that people use to schedule yes. tweets? Yep. Um, that, that, that's a very popular one. I don't know what the benefits of Buffer are over TweetDeck. Maybe Buffer offers analytics that I'm not fully aware of, but mm -hmm. Dave's manager, who's a very smart guy named Mark Tavern, who used to work at, at Island Def Jam, worked for Justin Bieber and all these people. Um, you know, He was formerly at RCA Victor, where he met Dave when Dave was on RCA in the early 2000s. But... Um, Mark has a lot of interesting ideas. He also has a blog, uh, just his name, marktavern.com, where he talks a lot about the issues that we're talking about here right. um, on a weekly basis. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, and then you've got people like, I mean, these these star instrumentalists who really don't have to do anything with sure. their social media presence, and they just rack up fans like it's nobody's business, you know. Right. Um, Nels Klein is an example. Uh, Chris Potter, saxophone player, is another example. Um, I mean, one one person who I have to say has really built his presence very slowly but strongly. Two people I'll say. Um, the trumpeter on Blue Note Records, Ambrose Akinmusery, who has a brand new album out this week. Um, not not plugging it in any uh, I've been I, I, I do have to admit I've been coyly slipping my clients into this conversation but I I do acknowledge and Ambrose is not a client although he's a good friend that he's really grown his his presence um, via Facebook and via Twitter and via Instagram um, his uh, I'm sure your your people can find him but Yep. You want to find him on Twitter and Instagram. His stuff is really generally good, and he shares interesting links about culture and, you know, uh, all, all kinds of topics. Um, is Ambrose Zire, uh, Ambrose with I-R-E at the end. So okay. um, you can find him out there. And also there's a drummer named Eric Harland who plays with Dave Holland and uh, has a long history of playing with the saxophonist Charles Lloyd and mm -hmm. Zakir Hussein. They have a band together. Um, he also plays with... Uh, he has his own band. We're rumored to have an ECM album in the works. Um, I don't know if that's still happening, but we've all been waiting for that for some time. Hello, Eric. How are you? Yeah, all right. Um, uh, it's, his band is called Voyager, and it's a very exciting band with a young guitar player named Julian Lodge and a bassist named Harish Raghavan who also plays with Ambrose um, and the pianist Taylor Eichstee and I think uh, Walter Smith III is a uh, 
saxophone player who also plays with Ambrose. So there's a lot of uh, cross pollination there, yeah, which is typical of jazz. So we we don't have a ton of time left, but when we before we came on air, you were talking about how uh, your business has grown through your own social media presence and, and the ways totally. in which you know tweeting and and being on Facebook has brought you clients, and so you can really speak to. Uh, the ways in which th this has really empowered uh, the work you do. Totally. I mean, I, I probably get five to ten business leads a month that have been generated through my company's Twitter presence, mainly Twitter, somewhat Facebook. I mean, the word among a lot of musicians is that I'm savvy with with new media technology and I have a strong web presence in general so mm -hmm. you know that once that word kinda gets out there then it's kind of um, you know it is like it kind of is what it is in terms of uh, just the referrals kinda coming in I mean I'm, I'm not sometimes I feel like I'm deluged with with inquiries and I just am at a capacity that I can't handle but right. and I have to turn people away but you know it's it's definitely helped my business a lot I've gotten business leads from all over the world um, I, I did a, a Q&A for the disc makers blog which is a duplicating service for musicians who put out CDs right. that that drew a bit of social media attention and then I got a lot of inquiries many from bands who I had no business talking to in other genres but who who were interested in talking to me about you know overall social media strategy so sure it's been uh, it's been a good run I mean yeah definitely I get overwhelmed all the time I don't check my Twitter feed you know, obsessively. I check my email obsessively. You have I check, to. Right? I check. You know, it's it's a lot of navel gazing. Like I check my, I check my Twitter for interactions more than I do for other people's tweets. I want to see how people have interacted with my tweets. Who's favorited? Who's replied? Who's retweeted? You know, sure. stuff like that. Um, it's kind of self-indulgent but it you know that's kind of the name of the game now um, but anyway yeah so I mean social media has been good to me it brought me into the business you could say uh, and it it has sustained me for people wanting me to be involved with them because I have this understanding of how to you know I mean not to speak brazenly but like Name me another jazz publicity firm out there with 5,000 fans on Twitter. I mean, followers. Yep. You know, none of them bought. None of them coerced. I mean, maybe there's some some BS in there in terms of, right. you know, like people who may not really be following me but just click the follow button and then... But, you know, the point is, like, it's not an insignificant number, and it's. I mean, I I've made a lot of tweets. Said so that the guy from NPR's blog Supreme once wrote that, you know, it's a gig, so Marowitz will be live tweeting it. Like that's just a given. It's, <laughs> it's a it's a high profile gig, so right. you got to assume that Marowitz is going to be live tweeting, or like, it's not legit somehow. But anyway, and that's that's yeah, that's the ultimate endorsement and seal of approval. I think I think where where we can leave it for today, and and, and what what you've really kind of helped me understand even more so uh, is the notion that a publicist today is not the guy behind the guy or the gal behind the gals. It's it's someone that has their own presence, their own autonomy and authority, uh, and and for lack of a better word, once again, has their own brand. And that behooves both their endeavors, the endeavors of their clients, and helps kind of cultivate this community that we've talked about uh, and keeping people engaged. And it's really the only way to have an authentic interaction with people because there is such an influx of content and material out there. Um, you know, you have to rise above it by being someone that isn't just blending in. And I think you've 
proven that you've been able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always changing. It's constantly changing, and and I just have to adapt with it. But you know, I I'm happy with my team. You know, I have a another publicist who works with me, Stephen Buono, who you can read about on my website, mm-hmm. and we have a a number of assistants who, you know, are. Uh, here at different times helping us out. We still mail physical CDs. I don't know why, but well, I do know why because there are certain unrepentant journalists who <laughs> will not adapt to the times and Change. frankly will not will not write about my clients unless I send them a physical CD and right. some of whom won't even write about it unless I send them a finished art copy of a CD. So right. You know, and I think that's changing. I mean, I think that every year there'll be less of them because the reality is then they start to become irrelevant. If if you can't, you know, speak intelligently and conversely converse in the parlance of the times, innovation is going to leave you behind. It's as simple as that. Yeah, but you know, Neil Young made that 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 post or that um, he gave a keynote at South by Southwest Interactive, I think yesterday or the day mm-hmm. before about. You know the the death of quality audio. Yes. Um, and like, I mean, it is an issue. Like listening to music on computer speakers is awful. I'm going to be working this John Coltrane unissued thing from Temple University in 1966 this fall, and I was listening to it for the first time, like for the first time ever, on my laptop speakers, and I was like. This sounds terrible, and I'm not even an audiophile. Right. So I get it. I mean, the the death of the death of quality audio is a concern to me too, because I want to be able to hear something in good fidelity. But it's hard uh, when the only when everybody's sending everything with Dropbox and we transfer and right. iTail and whatever to you know there there is a a ceiling on how much space you can store. Right stuff with without paying a ton of money, you know. Right. Well, so. I'll tell you what. Why don't we? Uh, there's still there's still more to discuss, and I think that could that could be a good pivot point for. Uh, first of all, the industry will probably have changed radically in the next few months, so we'll get you back to see what's changed in your world, and we can dive a little bit deeper into the the high audio um, because that that's a a paramount concern uh, here in the industry uh, and a personal kind of obsession. So. Can let, let's make a date uh, as soon as possible, and we'll get you back to dive a little bit deeper into that. Cool. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, th- th- thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I knew you dropped some knowledge, and you certainly did. Um, we will be promoting this, so check it out if you didn't catch us live. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Matt. Thank All right. Bye-bye. Cheers.